Okay, welcome everyone. It is uh, May 14th, 2019, and we are going to do a practice round of uh, the Ethics Bowl, the Truth Bowl, whatever you like to call it. Uh, and this is in anticipation of an event on Monday, the Ethics in the Far Future. And we have two teams here today, each made up of two, uh, two people. Uh, team A, would you like to introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Ernie Prabhakar. Uh, my background is in physics. I've been working in Silicon Valley for the last 20 years or so, and I'm very grateful to be here. I'm David Gleason. I'm uh, retired from high tech, uh, but I was a humanities major at UC Santa Cruz many years ago, and uh, I've been involved with the, the Ethics Bowl for about two years. Great. And Team B? Hi, I'm Bill Breck. I've been in Silicon Valley for 30 years as a uh, software entrepreneur. I have a major in uh, philosophy and computer science from Michigan. I'm David Johnson. Um, my uh, degrees were in physics and computer engineering. I've been in Silicon Valley as a software engineer for five years. Uh, please call me Dave. Okay, thanks. And I should say my name is John Ellis. Uh, and I'm going to turn things over to Kyle Robertson right now, who's going to be the moderator for this round. So Kyle will introduce the question and, uh, and then uh, we'll be off and running. The full round should take about, I think, something like a minute or an hour. And, and it, we're trying out this particular structure uh, and we'll see how it goes. So, Kyle. Sure, you're going to hear some yelling kids, so I'll keep trying to mute it when I'm not speaking. Uh, my name is Kyle Robertson. I'm a lecturer in the philosophy department at UC Santa Cruz and the assistant director of the Center for Public Philosophy. So, um, the question we're going to be talking about today is what role should thinking about the far future, 1,000 years ahead and beyond, play in research on the UCSC campus? So the teams have had this question already, so we're gonna start right in on team A's answer. Um, you'll have eight minutes, David and Ernie, and I will give you one minute and 10 second time warning. So take it away. Great, thank you very much, Kyle, and we are very excited. I'll speak first and then David will chime in a bit later on. And I think this is a really fascinating topic and I'm really excited about the chance to weigh in on this. I'm gonna try a little bit of a, a risky strategy here. I'm gonna rephrase the question to how could thinking about the far future a thousand years or more positively impact the way research is done on the UCSC campus with the hope that once I answer that, it'll give us a better context for answering the primary question. So from my perspective, I wanna start with a problem I think that this is hoping to solve. And I think the problem that we face, one of the most pressing issues we face as a civilization is we've lost the ability to have coherent moral debates. Uh, you know, since the demise of the Catholic Church uh, in the 15, 1600s, and really the demise of faith in the nation states during the 20th century between two world wars and various scandals, we've gotten to the place where we don't really have a coherent way to think about moral and ethical questions. And for me, the most exciting thing about this concept of the far future is the ability to use this as a framing device to get people of goodwill who genuinely care about making a better world to have a context in which they can be inspired to collaborate together in a way that helps us make better decisions, not just about posterity, but about how we live our lives today in light of that posterity. So my short answer is that uh, I believe that uh, under the right circumstances, that thinking about the far future could and should be a significant positive force for uh, structuring, organizing, and prioritizing research on the University of Santa Cruz campus. However, there's some very stringent contingents on how that would happen. In particular, my primary thesis is that this is valuable only to the extent that this is a unifying force that brings people together. That is, if we can use this image of the far future as a positive force and as something that is uh, sufficiently novel and welcoming that people can rally behind it, then I think that can provide a really useful way for framing the many difficult decisions uh, and both in terms of communication and prioritization and allocation of scarce resources. However, because of that, I believe it is essential that this be done in a bottom-up manner. 
And the reason is that one of the reasons we have such a fractured society is that trust in institutions is at an all time low in many dimensions. And that attempting to impose top down solutions based on pre existing moral authority is a very difficult challenge. And in particular, if we're competing for scarce resources and there's a political decision to fund this over that, that ends up burning political capital. And therefore, I believe that this is only really useful if we can use this as a tool for creating new political capital or social capital. And um, when David and I were discussing this, he says, this should not be a program. This really needs to be a movement. And I think that that is the most effective way that this vision of Earth as a Far Future can be powerful for helping organize research. So to be very concrete, what I would propose is that this should be organized not like a faculty department or even a funded institute or a center, but rather as a student association. And the role model I would suggest is the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, uh, a student organization which is uh, encouraged by and supported by NASA and groups like that, but is very much something where people who are passionate about it gather together. Uh, the example I use is that thinking about the Earth in the far future is like the, the Rawls talks about if you were designing a society from scratch and you don't know where you would be, what would it be like? And that's a useful st step for creating intellectual distance. The problem though is if you create too much intellectual distance, you also create emotional distance. And if you are too far emotionally resolved from the problem, it's hard to have any weight in that. For example, I have friends who don't believe the earth will be here in a thousand years, either because of a uh, catastrophe or a rapture or something like that or they believe that the Earth will be irrelevant because we'll be in millions of planets and we'll have forgotten Earth. Uh, or they believe that humanity won't be here in a thousand years because of computers or evolution or extinction or genetic engineering. So I think that for this to be meaningful, we need to constrain it to say, we believe that it is good for Earth and humanity to be here a thousand years from now. And whatever else we do in the universe and with our biology, that maintaining Earth and humanity as a positive thing that we would be proud of a thousand years from now is a worthy goal. And starting from that, we engage in an organic process of dialogue such as this to say, you know, hey, can we try to use this concept as a way to integrate and inspire ourselves to work through our differences and articulate a common vision of the future that will inspire other people? And so that's my main thesis, is that we should do this as a bottom-up organic cultural movement rather than a political or academic top-down phenomena. This is difficult. Of course, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, but I believe that this is exciting enough that it's worth a try. And we have a unique opportunity here with Santa Cruz and Silicon Valley so close together, where there's this unique combination of humanities and artistic and environmental thinking, coupled with all the tools and technologies of Silicon Valley, to be able to really uh, you know, have at least a chance to create a compelling vision of the future that can rally people around it. David, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a, that's a good segue. Uh, thanks, Ernie. I thought that was great. Um, I'm very committed to this program and this idea. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've been writing a series of profiles on UC Santa Cruz Humanities graduates and what they've done with their careers. And what I'm particularly interested in, Ernie just started to go down that path, is that this is a, has to be a collaborative effort between science and humanities. Um, I was a humanities major and I know I'm talking to a bunch of scientists here and a bunch of computer people. So I wanted to get a pitch in for the humanities. One of the things that occurred to me, Ernie raised the point about whether we'll be here in a thousand years. And I tried to think when this first came up a month ago, what do, we, what do I know that's last, that was built for a thousand years? And of course, the, the, the tragic story that came to mind was the, was the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, which you know, caught on fire last month. And I realized that when they built that cathedral and the, when they started in the 12th century, they, they were building it to last a thousand years. And so we've actually done of confidence that uh, we're not doing something completely unprecedented. The other thing that Ernie also touched on, again, this is a humanities perspective. I worked for a manager years ago who uh, uh, kept taking on more work for his group. And when he did, he had to hire more people. And someone said, you're building an empire. And he stopped them. He said, no. I'm not building an empire. I'm trying to build a movement. But he did it by taking on the work. So the point that I wanted to make is that the way we build a movement 
is by taking on the work. And I think that's an, uh, an aspect that um, isn't obvious. I mean, obviously the, the uh, Sandy Faber and the others who worked on this are committed and want to do the, the work, but we have to have more than just science involved. We have to have the humanities involved and they have to be willing to do the work and take on the, um, take on the challenge. Okay, is that it? All right. Good. Good. All right, thank you guys. So team B, you'll have a two minute clock to discuss with each other before we hear from you. So eight minutes and I'll give you the one minute and the 10 second warning also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start my timer just before we go. Sure, no problem. Yeah. You said we have eight minutes? Eight minutes total, that's right. Okay, okay we can start. Go for it. Um, so one of the problems I'm having with your idea is that I don't think you really looked into the causes of the, the breakdown in moral discussions in society. I and mean, you talked about, hey, there was a collapse of the uh, Catholic Church as an authority, but why did it collapse as an authority? And in particular, I, I didn't hear the most important words, postmodernism. Why are we not talking about postmodernism and its role in all of this? Like, I think any attempt to sort of deal with the, the collapse of moral debate and how society is fracturing needs to deal with the fact that postmodernism has played a role in this and how it tears down any sort of narrative. And um, what I think your biggest challenge is going to be is that the fact that you are constructing your own new narrative, which is we need to think about the far future and then use this as a unifying idea, a unifying principle. Why should that be a unifying principle? Why should people support that? Why is that better than any other idea? Um, postmodernism is adept at sort of tearing this apart. So why won't like uh, some um, postmodern scholar come along and say, hey, why this? Is this just not some other God that you are put, putting, um, trying to replace the Christian God with? Why should we believe this? Why should we get behind this? Um, another attack might be just like, well, is this just not, you know, um, more Western colonialism trying to create a unifying idea to sort of conquer the world and unify everybody? There, these are these are avenues of attack that you, you haven't really addressed and really thought about. And considering postmodernism, I think that took down debate in the first place. You need to have a defense ready for that. You need to address it. And I would like to see that. Um, you talk about this being an organic bottom-up movement, and um, I don't know how you're doing that. I, you haven't really explained how this is. You've mentioned a student organization. I would like to you know, hear from students, and like, how are they being involved? How are they doing this? I don't, I don't, know, how you, I don't know how you generate a organic bottom-up movement, because I think any sort of idea of trying to create that is itself sort of top-down. Um, it doesn't seem organic or natural if we're sitting here discussing how to do this. Um, but I don't know what you mean. Like, maybe, maybe you mean something else than what I'm imagining. So I would like more explanation on how that would work. Um, another thing that I think that's sort of unclear is I'm not sure what you're imagining you're going to create. Now, you gave the example of Notre Dame, and that's, I think, a little bit of a disappointing example because it's just a single structure. If we want to build structures that last a thousand years, we can do that. We have the engineering capability. If you want to go build, you know, bridges and um, homes and structures that last a thousand years, that's a solved problem. We can do that. They exist. We can put them all over the place. I assume that's not what you mean, though, but you haven't actually specified what you mean. If you're talking about generating ideas, now, there are, there are ideas that have lasted that long. We can go, you know, back to Socrates and Plato, and they have some ideas about philosophy that have lasted, you know, thousands of years. And like, perhaps, uh, you know, that's what you're thinking, like maybe we can generate those, but why is this venue the right way to generate ideas that last a long time? Aren't, you know, good ideas themselves, you know, long lasting? Why do we need to do any work besides just generating good ideas? So I, I don't know what you're trying to build or like why you think this is, is helpful. Bill, what do you have to add? Bernie, I, I definitely appreciate you taking the risky approach. I think reframing the question um, could have been useful, but I think you went a little bit too far. Um, I think uh, it's not necessarily true, taking the long-term perspective, that we have lost the ability to have coherent public debate. When I'm comparing it to feudal ages, where it was just nobles, I see the internet having lots of interesting uh, distributed debate and discussion forums. Um, maybe you know, what we see in Washington is, is what you're focused on, that perhaps is suboptimal, but I do see many new emerging ways to have public debate. So I'm not, not necessarily convinced that we've, we've gone in um, a reverse direction. Um, I'm not also going to agree necessarily that that's the world's most pressing issue. 
Uh, it might be one of many pressing issues. Many people would argue uh, global warming is a greater pressing issue than other, other alternative can. So I don't think you demonstrate that that's necessarily the, the number one issue. Um, not even sure that support for institutions that is at an all-time low. I think uh, the Warriors kind of are the institution for basketball, and there's plenty of institutions around the world, Berkeley, Stanford, others that seem to get a lot of uh, mind share and, and other time uh, resource commitments. Um, and the idea of the, the grassroots uh, movement, um, I think it's great for a variety of things. I don't know why that's necessarily the best um, structure for um, trying to devise coherency among, among our, our culture. And the same point, I, we, I think we would like some more details on um, what the student approach, what the grassroots approach looks like. Your example you gave us was good, but we're not familiar with that. Um, I think you spent more time saying it shouldn't be an institution, it shouldn't be a department. Um, but I, we need to hear reasons why you feel those are not valid approaches. I think the, the most interesting thing you proposed was the intellectual distance versus emotional distance. I appreciate that. And I think, um, I would, I would want to add that probably probably a time perspective is another uh, distancing, which makes it hard for the person you know who, who believes we're going to be gone in a thousand years. So that, I think that's the one I would focus on is um, convince that person that you're taking the right approach and how, how quickly can you get them to buy into this, this proposal. Anything else? Oh, and yeah, you know, things. Um, most researchers would agree diversity is a better long-term approach than unity. So I, I think, you know, extreme, you know, extreme disunity is bad, but lockstep unity is also bad. We would argue for a middle. You know, yeah. You have two minutes if you want, but you can also cede your time if you're finished. Um, I thought our time was six minutes. Um, no, you get eight minutes for the initial presentation, six minutes for the commentary. Well, you know, I got one extra point I was sort of thinking about. Um, so you talked about uh, gaining distance by thinking about things far in the future, an emotional distance. And uh, one question uh, was, what economic systems could last a long time? And I'm like actually wondering whether or not you could gain sufficient emotional distance. If we were to go to a communist and ask them what system in the distant future is the best for society, they're going to say communism, and their entire way of life is based on that. Right. Well, and here in the West, we're going to say capitalism, where and there are a lot of people, or at least in the West, who would say that. And like they're emotionally attached to that answer. It is their entire way of life, and it doesn't matter what time period you look at. They have one minute. Honest. Okay. Again, the diversity versus unity thing. I mean, I think um, you start off saying you know, the goal is to have coherency, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the goal. I think the goal is back to what's best for humanity and the earth. And um, unity, I think there's ways we could achieve that. Hitler tried, others tried, but um, I think it's an ongoing process. I'm not necessarily looking for something that will last, you know, a structure that lasts for a thousand years or a mindset. I think we want a process that will last for, um, you know, millions of years that helps us always optimize. It's not necessarily within two or five years we're gonna have that perfect unified structure in place. Ten seconds. You guys good? Good. Okay. Thank you. So now um, David and Ernie will have two minutes to confer and then six minutes for your commentary period. Okay. Uh, Bill and Dave, thanks. Thanks for your comments. I really appreciate it. Uh, we listened very closely and uh, took them to heart. Uh, you raised some good issues and I'll try to respond uh, in a meaningful way. Um, you, know, you talked first of all about the breakdown of society. I, I don't think I don't think in eight minutes we wanted to, to deal with that. <laughs> I think what we're trying to do today is just lay out um, a high level um, conceptual overview of what, why we think this is a good idea. Uh, certainly something that has to be talked about. And postmodernism, same thing. We're not gonna deal with that issue uh, out of the gate. Uh, what we really wanna do as a start is inspire people to believe that this is something that has value, that has meaning. Um, we believe that ideas like this, this is, this is a project, but it's an idea. It starts with an idea in a community, and, and then a, an idea within a community has things that are, are, are manifestations, uh, things like, like art projects and, and words. That it's not the artifacts that we're talking about, but the, the belief that inspires those, those, uh, those artifacts. And we're trying to cut across polarizations 
and, and factions that exist currently that are invested in the status quo and find reasons for them to take a step back and say, maybe we can look at this a different way. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're also trying to inspire uh, UC Santa Cruz to uh, ally with um, uh, people over the hill in, in the Silicon Valley. We think there are common interests there. And so that's the, the high level uh, thrust we're trying to get at. Ernie, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that you guys raised a bunch of interesting issues. Uh, one question I would like to hear your answer is that I feel like um, uh, Bill was kind of defending like, oh, things aren't that bad. And, and uh, Dave seemed more like, oh yeah, things are all messed up because of postmodernism. So I was curious if you two have reached a consensus on that, that could articulate in a way that's clearer to me where you stand on that issue. The way I look at it um, is I don't see postmodernism as the problem. I see postmodernism as a reaction to the breakdown in the mod modernistic ways of describing institutions and believing we can know the truth and build the future. And I think if I get that impression of the, that we're trying to build something that we think this thing is gonna last for a thousand years, that was unintentional and I apologize for that. What I think that we can say we can do, and I think a postmodernist would actually engage with us really well, is that like we're trying to create a narrative here based on authenticity and art, the things that we are passionate about and believe in. And we're not saying this is the most important thing or the only important thing or this will actually last, but it's something that matters to us and is meaningful. And we invite people who do find it engaging and interesting to come and have this dialogue about what we could do. And my understanding of language and institutions is they flow out of communities. And that you need a community that is diverse, but it can't be so diverse that you can't have a common language and a common mission. And so our hypothesis is that focusing on Earth in the far future gives us a long-term vision that cuts across many different disciplines and the religious and economic and technological divides that threaten other issues, and at least has a chance of creating a diverse community of people from many different viewpoints that can engage around this issue. And the mechanics I would suggest is that like we have a lot of energy around this, we have the ethics bowl happening. Let's say that we find, we get people, give them a chance to just self-select and say, hey, I actually think, you know, we come up with a really short statement, like we wanna see if we can inspire a community to rally around creating a future a thousand years from now where earth and humanity are something that we're proud of. And they can come up with better wording than that. We say, hey, look, just stick up there and see who shows up. And you see, if you get five people, you get 50 people, you show up and you have a meeting and you say, okay, what could, you know, find out where people are at, what they're passionate about, what they're excited about, and say, okay, can we come up with a project, a thing that we can do that would really express this value that we feel in an authentic way that would then attract other people to the cause and you bootstrap it. This is precisely the process that Silicon Valley has perfected with the lean startup. You come up with a hypothesis, you see who it attracts, you work with that team to come up with a minimum viable demo, a symposium, a workshop, a fair, whatever it is, an art exhibit depends on who shows up and what they're willing to invest in. And then you do that, and then you, you use that groundswell for, as they've already done by having the ethics bowl. There's enough people who are interested enough to create the ethics bowl. And then like, okay, let's have a discussion and see what, how we can articulate the vision in a way that attracts more people. And then you use that momentum to snowball into a large group. And we don't know how large it'll get. We can have aspirations of having dozens of, you know, hundreds of chapters around universities and holding conferences and workshops but maybe it's just something that will be at least authentically meaningful to those who will participate, even if it's just once or twice and it peters out, hopefully we've had a positive transformational experience that we will take out. So that's the vision of how to create it. I'm actually want to stop there. David, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I just wanted to re reiterate that uh, we really see this as a collaborative effort between UC Santa Cruz and uh, some of the, different companies and organizations in Silicon Valley that, that this partnership is, is actually critical. And again, uh, the, um, it's not just science, although the basis, I think uh, the principle, the argument they made uh, was, um, uh, where was it? Sandy Favor had written something about um, the core idea is to use the best science of the day to develop scenarios for intelligent life on earth. Um, I, I think that's a great basis, but I think again, we need, we need the, the humanistic insights and, and um, instincts to, and, and, and skills to guide that because it can't just be a scientific project. There's gotta be, there's gotta be more, more uh, skin in the game than that, more belief. Okay, that's time.
Um, okay, so Team B, you have two minutes to confer before you have a six minute commentary period. All right, going on mute. Okay, Team B, that's two minutes. So you're good. So what's the next stage? All right, so oh, the next stage, Team B gets to do the same thing. They get to do the commentary response to Team A. So you have six minutes on the clock whenever you're ready. Okay, so first thing I want to address is uh, the sense of disunity between Bill and I. Um, let me be clear about my position. Uh, I agree with Bill. Things aren't that bad. I would say things are better now than ever before. We have a lot of optimism. We are pulling people out of poverty around the world at faster and faster rates. I think this is a fantastic time to be alive. So no, it's not that the world is ending. It's quite the opposite, I would say. Um, the, what I would say, though, is that there are actual problems. And like the political discourse in this country is one, you know, one region in which there are some problems. And we do care and we do want to solve these problems. But as like Bill pointed out, there are actually you know different venues in which you know debate is actually going on very successfully. The internet is a very you know diverse, crazy place, and so I'm just sort of saying like you're proposing an idea, and I don't understand why you think that idea is going to live up to any sort of scrutiny. In particular, you admitted that um, this idea is in fact a narrative, and as I tried to point out before, postmodernism. Um, is adept at analyzing, dissecting, and undermining and dismantling narratives. That's the whole point. And I don't understand how this is not just another god for postmodernism to, to kill. It's just like you're setting up a second sort of Catholic church. Instead of just having uh, Yahweh as the god, you have this idea of the far future. And postmodernism is very good at just tearing these things down. And I haven't heard really anything that will prevent that from happening. You're not going to get along with the postmodernists. I promise you that. Um, so I don't, I don't see how this is going to resolve or fix anything. Um, and then once again, I, I don't understand like why this idea must be the one that should survive and should live. Um, we do believe in a diversity of ideas. We do like that sort of uh, competition. We don't think there needs to be complete unity when it comes to ideas. Now, Disunity, especially when it reaches levels of violence, is something I think we can all agree is bad. And we do want to sort of gain some coherence there. But I'm, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to sort of have one unifying principle like this in which everyone must adhere. Uh, Bill, do you have anything you want to throw in? Um, you know, I'll go back to Ernie's point about the intellectual distance gap. Um, thanks to technology, um, the, there has been a knowledge explosion I don't know if that's necessarily a people issue, but you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Um, we have, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's a, a problem facing humanity 
and it might be beyond humanity. Um, only machine learning perhaps might be able to deal with the, the buckets of data that are generated every every microsecond. Um, I feel a little bit like this is a kind of like the hippie movement redux. It's like get people <laughs> together, be nice to each other, diversity, go to India. Um, so I just want to get a little bit more meat on how this is going to be different. And we, we asked for some more details on what that student process looks like. If it's just limited students, that's, that's, that's kind of a small segment, sub-segment of the world or society. Um, why not create a third national political party, even beyond a movement? Um, I think they too try and come up with new ideas and go across factions. You see, especially in Europe, there's always new parties being created. Um, I, I don't think that's something that, that you have a, a, a um, Monopoly on is, is trying to get, you know, cross current. I, I even see it in companies. I see companies consciously trying to get um, diverse thinkers in for new projects. Uh, yes, um, great collaboration opportunities with Silicon Valley. Um, I think that startup process, I, it sounds like you're, you're now really proposing just start something small, start with a project, start with an artwork project, you know, snowball. Yes, we see that in Silicon Valley. We have to realize that um, many Silicon Valley companies get really big and ossified and institutional and act in bad ways. So we need to go beyond just that initial stage uh, model that Silicon Valley has nailed. And I think these $10 billion companies, we're seeing lots of big issues in Silicon Valley that, that need some debate and discussion. And those, those are at the global level already. Um, David, anything else? Uh, no. Uh... I do think that like um, it, it's it's kind of uh, tagging off of that, that the idea of having Silicon Valley as a model is sort of interesting considering how much scrutiny they're under right now and how much controversy is centered on Silicon Valley. Uh, it does seem that like at first when they do sort of grow up, they grow up very quickly, they, they do have moderate success, but then they get to these monolithic sizes and suddenly there's a lot of problems. Um, there's problems of uh, privacy, there's problems of abuse, there's transparency, there's the Me Too movement. I mean, like Silicon Valley has a lot of problems that just don't seem to be getting addressed or fixed. Yeah, and I'm not sure that that's due to um, the ability to, I mean, they, yeah, it might be that we've lost, maybe maybe the problem is, One minute. Problem. too much. Um, you know, we have, we have now in the U.S. enshrined that corporations have equal rights to citizenship. So you know, maybe the problem might be corporations are too powerful as opposed to we've, we've lost the ability to have public discourse. Um, just an example of why things are better. I uh, heard recently reminded that China pulled 300, 300 million people out of dire poverty in a super fair time period. This is one example of why things are probably better than before. And today's point about the humanities, um, yeah, I originally read Sandy's proposal, her paper, and but she does have a twin track, two equal tracks, and that second track is heavy humanities involvement, um, the moral compass, the guidelines, and it's not secondary. But I also felt that it should be part of that initial track. There's no reason why it can't be guiding the generation. Mm. Right, well, thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. So now we're going to have a three-minute control period where John and I can talk, and then we will have a 16-minute Q&A, sort of alternating team by team, where we get to ask you whatever questions we want. So everyone's there. So the way this is going to work, John and I are going to ask questions, and our idea to try is to just alternate. So the first question is to A, then B, then A, then B. But I'm not going to hold it. Well, we'll see what happens. So I just have a 16-minute running clock, and we will go from there. Okay? Um, so let me start. So I want to ask the first question of Team A. I would really love to hear more about, and, and Team B picked up on this a little, sort of an affirmative argument why thinking about the far future itself is the idea to use in this context. I heard a lot about like how to do it. So, um, you know, you talked a lot about, you know, collaboration among different groups and do it as a student associated. But like, why this idea? Like why, there's plenty of other candidate ideas, right? People are motivated by fighting racism, by, you know, notions of AI on a timeline of much closer than a thousand years, by social justice in general. There's a wide variety of motivating moral principles. Why this one? Um, so are you, you talked about how it might unify people or it would only be useful insofar as it brought people around this idea. But why would it? I mean, why do you think that this idea would bring people together? Sure. So I'll take that first, if, if that's okay, is that 
we're not claiming that this is like the only idea that could possibly work or that this is one idea that we're gonna, like everyone must use. I feel like some of the criticism was leveled against us perhaps implying that. That's not what I meant to imply. What I said was, I was like, this is an idea that I find engaging for a couple of reasons. And it seems like there's other people who find this engaging too. So it seems worth a try. And in particular, like the issue is things like racism and social justice. In my experience, those are extremely emotionally polarizing issues that it's very hard to have a creative intellectual discussion about. And so the fact that David and I, you know, we're able to have some really interesting discussions around this and that there's people at Santa Cruz who want to do this, it feels like, and I've been studying things like creating a third political party, and those are really hard, <laughs> right? There have been lots of failure modes of that. This is something that's novel, that hasn't obviously failed, that has some attributes where it seems like if it's done well, could cut across traditional lines of polarization and discourse right, right. and enable creativity. And so I'm willing to give it a try. And if there's people who are willing to do that, I think it's worth investing a few hours and a few weeks to see if we can generate something that validates the hypothesis that this could bring people together in an unusual way. Okay, I think I followed, sorry, Andy, there's a lot of breakup. I don't know about the Thanks. internet connection. So Kyle, should I go ahead? Yeah, just go ahead then. Okay, so we're gonna alternate. Um, I'm gonna ask Team B a question. Um, so Team B, you clearly uh, you know, disagreed with a lot of uh, the perspective and arguments that um, Team A gave. And I'm wondering, um, now that doesn't mean your disagreements with their arguments uh, doesn't mean that you uh, don't think that UC Santa Cruz uh, shouldn't be putting resources in. And so I'm wondering what, how, how you think of the answer, uh, what you think of this question. Do you think that, um, no, they shouldn't be, you know, this is uh, not something that uh, um, we should be putting many resources into? I'll go first. Um, I think uh, UC Santa Cruz, why not start there? I, I, the proposal was like a two-year pilot. And I think Ernie's been proposing, Ernie did you know, start small. So I, I would back in particular pilot. And the purpose of the pilot is to get more clarity on, on structure, planning, and things like that. So no, I'm not going to send a billion dollar check today, but um, pilot like in Silicon Valley. <laughs> yes, on that. Um, I think it should, we're always going to take the middle ground. I think it shouldn't just be student associations. Again, I felt that it's very limited. I think the proposal from Sandy was um, a mix of researchers, institutions, and this pretty unique thing of heavy public involvement, which could involve students, but I think that's exciting. So we would like to uh, see that public involvement piece developed further. I think we know what the research institutions look like, but that seemed to me to be the exciting piece. Um, I, I would actually, I think my biggest problem is I would say the idea is not at all novel. Long-term thinking is, is something that many people have brought up as an idea and something that people do think about. And uh, just taking UC Davis as an example, they have an endowment of about a billion dollars. They expect to live as an institution for the next century, certainly, and probably for a thousand years. And they are thinking at that sort of time scale when they first set up and when and as they are going forward. So I don't think this is a very novel idea at all. I think a lot of institutions have thought about this and are thinking about this. So I don't I don't know why it would be very unified. Um, or something that would be seen as striking or interesting. And so that's sort of like where I'm like, why? Wait, can I respond? Uh, uh, no, sorry, Ernie. And the judges, we, we go back. Uh, the judges, we are, uh, at least the, 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 the tentative way that we've set this up is uh, not to have a back and forth in the judges round. There's um, a final word though, right? So you, you'll have that. There's a last word, yes. Um, so John's going to ask a question of team A then, so we don't keep alternating, and I'm only asking one team, and he's only asking the other team. Yeah. Um, so uh, to team A, um, there are so many things 
Of, of course, I think in a perfect world, if we had unlimited resources, it would be great to give this a shot. See, you know, see whether it really brings people together and um, creates this moral compass and so on. Um, but there's so many pressing, urgent uh, needs uh, that, that we have in this country, in the world, in the state. Um, uh, and uh, does this one uh, does this one rise to the top? Uh, should this you know you know UCSC obviously doesn't have unlimited resources. In fact, it's it's you know there's a lot of important proposals that aren't going to be able to be funded. Is this one? Do you think this one is one that really should be up there? Uh, can I answer that, Ernie? Ernie, your mute is off. Are you saying this? Yeah. Yeah, John, uh, let me respond. I think, uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Bam, it only ran once. Um, yeah, it's really obvious that's a basic question. Why would we spend money on this and we could be spending on something else? The, the point that uh, Ernie and I discussed earlier that, that really struck me about this proposal is that we really are on, any organization has to plan short term and long term. It has to be strategy, it has to be tactics. And there's a lot of tactical stuff going on in this day and age, but there's there's an urgency that that Sandy's paper points out. If if we continue at the current rate of economic development, you know we're going to need a hundred times or twenty times, whatever it is, the, the resources within a human lifetime, which is obviously not only unsustainable but it's catastrophic. So when you're you know the, the metaphor is you're, you're on an airplane, and um, the plane you know is going to run out of gas. You really, really want to worry about uh, whether you're getting your money's worth on the video. There's so you know, I mean, I'm being glib, but there's a there's a sense of uh, urgency not in the short term, but urgency in the medium term, and that if there's no planning done, that will come up and 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 hit us sooner than uh, than we're prepared for. I I think that was part of what Ernie's point was is that uh, things are not great. I mean, yes, people are being pulled out of poverty, but if the world's heating at two degrees every 20 years and the polar ice caps melt, it's, it's kind of a moot point. So our sense is that this is a way to take a step away from the urgent matters, just like a family or a business has to step away from the day-to-day -day or any, any relationship and look at the long-term and decide whether we're on the right track or whether there's a trajectory that we have to somehow um, um, intervene on and, and, and modify. That, I think that's a primary motive for this, to create the distance so that we can, we can see the present. Okay, thanks. I can chime in about okay, that. Also, um, okay, I can. One of the things that, what? who's talking? I wanted to chime in, is that allowed? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah go ahead, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, to, if I can slightly tenuously rest another point, we're not saying that, this is not about making sure that UC survives for a thousand years. This is trying to make sure that Earth and humanity survives for a thousand years. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit larger than what most institutions think about. And we're not asking like to sign a blank check and devote all of UC's resources to this. We're asking them to commit to a incremental progress where we have to show engagement. I think Bill's point is an excellent one. This should, this should not be like UC should fund this. UC should provide like seed capital to nucleate this thing. And we need to bring in students and corporations and politicians and the public and other groups and test if this is actually capable of doing it. And maybe it's not, but I want to at least make sure that we're arguing about the right thing, which is that we are trying to focus people's attention on a thing that does not get enough attention that might help us solve these other issues like global warming, like political discourse, and so forth. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so Team B, one of the concepts that was in your presentation and came up again was this notion of postmodernism and something that you wanted to me to talk about. I'd love to hear more about it. So it seemed like you thought this was a problem for constructing any grand moral narrative or sort of big picture of, you know, around which we could unify and aim towards a better future. I and mean, what do you think postmodernism is and why is it such a grand challenge that we need to respond to? I know that's too big for two minutes, but can you, just a little bit about why you think it's such a big deal. If you don't mind, I'll take this. Uh, I, I would say that like, what postmodernism mostly did was it, it analyzed narratives it, and it dissected them down to pieces and then sort of just demolished them, undermining any belief in them. And uh, as, as Nietzsche is famous for saying, God is dead, um, we've killed him. 
And this is the idea is just sort of like when we create these narratives about like an arc, a path of, uh, of humanity, um, that they're all sort of equivalent to, to each other. And if they're all sort of equivalent to each other, it's really hard to say one is superior to another. Um, and that's sort of where it kind of comes down to why disbelief over any other, why this narrative is better than any other. And I think a lot of the postmodernist answer is that there is no grand narrative. There is no answer. Um, now, I'm not actually a postmodernist. I don't necessarily agree with that. I would just say, though, that their arguments are very strong, so much so it has undermined most religious institutions from being the dominant forces in the world to the significantly weaker. And uh, it, it is something you're going to have to contend with, no matter what, I think. Okay. Um, okay, so team A. One of the things I was hoping for more of is um, what's on our score sheet is, is factor three, right? What do you think is the strongest argument against this position you're defending? What do you think somebody who disagrees with you would focus on? And in particular, I had a little concern uh, either of you, that the rephrasing of the question, right? Reframing the question as how could such a thought positively impact research on campus is glossing over the idea that people who disagree with you will be like, it won't. <laughs> it will negatively impact, yeah, right? So, so putting positive in the question itself, I'm worried might have, I can respond to either part of that. Sure, let me just say, uh, so fair point. So. Um, I feel like if we phrase this as, hey, this is a hypothesis, give us just a room, you know, and, you know, $5,000 for flyers and invitations, and to see if we can bootstrap something, I think there'll be a lot less opposition to it than if it's giving us $2 million for a center uh, for doing this. And so I think that the, the, the strongest objection I think that people rightly object to about how this discussion has happened in the past is this was perceived as a political maneuver. Uh, I'm not saying this is true or not, but I think there was a perception by, by some well-placed people to push their pet project as something that the institution, as the university as a whole, must endorse that would take resources from other things. And I agree that if that was the reality, I could see a lot of people having a lot of negative concerns about it. I think the point that Bill made was a really good one. This has to be presented and developed as a non-zero-sum project that adds to the pie. That is not like, we are the people who have the right answer and you must bow before us, but like, hey, we've got a really interesting idea. We would love to dialogue with you to see how it intersects with the ideas you have. And that's what I think is the defense against that. And there certainly are gonna be people who are gonna just say, well, I just think you guys are idiots. And that's fine. That's actually a good thing at this stage of an idea development. People should critique it and source it. But then all we're asking for is really just a little bit of seed capital to try and prove the idea out and prove the haters wrong. And if they're right, we'll find out fairly quickly and cheaply. But they might be wrong. Maybe there is room for more dialogue around this. And therefore, I think that that would hopefully uh, neutralize. Now, there are some people who might say, like, this is just dangerous. That any idea, or, and there are people who would just say, like, any attempt to divert attention away from this is toxic and evil. And you know that is an understandable reaction. I would argue that's primarily an emotional reaction that needs to be engaged with one-on-one -on -one to understand uh, you know, why they're being triggered like that. Um, and so I don't think an intellectual analysis in the abstract is likely to accomplish much. But I do agree that those individuals should be engaged with one-on-one -on -one to try and work through that. Like I'd love to sit down with Bill one-on-one -on -one and understand his interest in postmodernism and how much of that is where all that's coming from, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. Okay, we have one minute left. Um, okay, well, I'll ask uh, Team B real quick. Um, why do you, what makes you think that what Team A is suggesting is to create one narrative that everyone is encouraged to endorse, like a thesis, like, you know, this is what we will believe in forever, or something like that. Um, I mean, they, they stated mm -hmm. that they were creating a narrative. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I believe that. But um, I mean, the reason why uh, it's, I think. What, what narrative do you think they are creating? 
that, that the way that we should be thinking about problems and deciding answers is through this lens of a, a thousand years in the future. What is it going, what's going to, the world going to be like? How is this going to, uh, what the, how is this going to solve problems in that far? The thing that sort of long time perspective, that's the lens that they want to operate under. And um, I think that like you, you choose the lens of the you view the world and this is what they are proposing that people should be using as opposed okay, to thank you that's time so i'm going to cut you off sorry that, that's good so that uh, we're over 16. so that's the judges q a period and so now um team a gets a chance to confer for two minutes for their three and a half minute final word whenever you're ready yeah. all right uh, thank you this was a great discussion um i think david and i both uh, learned some things and we will have lots of questions to, to continue to deep dive on. I think our, our, our final word is we, we still um, would advocate a, 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 a middle row proposal, kind of like take the best of everything that has been created. There is something to be said uh, for Ernie's saying we need something novel, and that reminds me of the concept of uh, disrupted equi equilibrium, which happens in the natural world every, every eon or so. And so maybe our society is so ossified that we just need a Let's just try something brand new, push, push kind of hard reset button. But I'm, I'm not sure that that's warranted for this issue. I think um, we're going to try and synthesize. Again, I think this, the, the grass level movement is sort of captured in Sandy's proposal about um, new and concerted efforts to have more public involvement uh, in ways other than political voting, um, using Silicon Valley technologies. That, that's something which should be explored. But I'm also a bit confused. Uh, is the focus on problem solving, long-term problems, or is it also looking for positive opportunities? So I'd like to have a little bit more focus. And uh, it's almost like you need two separate institutions for that. But um, it seems like the tone tends to be more problem solving. So we need to sort of say, what is the tone? Is, is it more of this problem solving? And political parties bounce back and forth between we're going to solve this problem versus here's this brave, great, great new future. I'd, I'd like to see some kind of taking a put it taking the ground as a positive things. And then finally, in terms of a structure, um, it seems like everything that was listed by Sandy is, is truly global issues. Nothing in there was California specific. Um, yeah, a lot of technologies are coming out of California, but these these global problems, um, geez, there's all sorts of problems related to unified, coherent public debates. I mean, the UN is there, G20 is there. We we can imagine plenty of alternatives to that, but. Typically, these, these global problems, which are usually wicked problems, um, a lot of research is saying these are called super problems, and they have to be addressed by multiple contingencies. So not just good chapters, they have to be addressed by multiple governments, um, industry, and academic institutions. So I think you've left at least three of those important groups typically participate in a super problem discussion off the table. And I think there have been uh, Plenty of valid examples of, of super problems being being addressed, carbon credits and other other things, all sorts of interesting uh, banking regulations. These these things are, are big global um, issues. And then finally, um, yeah, uh, work with Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley has has had definitely a lack of ethical guidance. Um, I think again, my my concern is corporations are too powerful. We need to have a lot more public input on what these powerful multinational corporations are doing. We're already seeing um, some rudimentary form of public participation through government regulation creeping in, but we should um, envision some scenarios other than um, you know, government regulation of big private corporations. I think, um, seeing how we set up- 10 seconds. Trading, um, and in particular, the, the issue of, of super powerful global corporations, which seem to be more powerful than governments. That's, that's something I'd like to be explored. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, out of time. Thanks. Um, so I guess we'll give another minute, another couple minutes for David and Ernie. To see if they want I think you can just go, David, right? No, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead. We'll go ahead. All right. I'll reset the clock. And you'll have three and a half minutes yourself. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. And Ernie, uh, feel free to jump in if, if, um, if you want. Uh, uh, give me just a minute to uh, I, uh, thank you guys. Um, it's, it's good to clarify some of these things. Um, I think Ernie and I, when we talked, we said we'd, we want to kind of restate our position, which is that we see this as a, um, as a, as a, um, 
a proposal for a, a center not to resolve problems. I know you guys are by nature problem solvers and that's great and we have to do that, but initially we have to see the problem differently. Um, and we're, we're seeing, we see certain aspects of, of problems in one way and as you guys who are scientists and, and technologists know, uh, there's always a blind side. And, and the point I think of the proposal that I saw is that we're trying to identify what our blind sides are because we have them and we have our blinders on in some ways. So the idea of this center is to take a step back and, and revisit what our assumptions are and what our, um, what our current solutions to problems are and, and take, a, take a fresh look at things. I, I wanna go back to my initial metaphor, which, which Dave didn't like uh, about the uh, Notre Dame because he raised a good point. You know, if you wanna build buildings, we got people to build buildings. Um, my point, which I didn't clarify very much, is that Notre Dame was never a building. It was, sure it was a building, but it was a community. It was a belief. It was, a, um, it was actually a national um, point of pride. It was, it was a, an expression of um, the, the formation of the French state, I mean, according to historians. And so what I'm getting at is that what we're doing with this, what we would do with this foundation or this, this um, organization is, is much more than create a dialogue between Silicon Valley and, and UC Santa Cruz. It would create a new kind of, and, and I'll use the word narrative, because it's something that's missing. And I know that the postmodernists will attack it, but we don't feel that's a basis for not doing it. Uh, it's, it's a valid concern. You need to know your enemies and you need to anticipate it. But the initial point is to start with a, a clean slate with what is we want humanity to do in the next thousand years. And, and no one's really doing that. This is a chance to take a fresh look at things uh, that will help us visualize how we're gonna solve problems in the future, not in the present, but later on. Ernie, you wanna jump in? Yeah, and I think, and I think one point that, I feel like we're necessarily that divergent uh, in that what we're pitching for is not so much just a, like a single center and this is the high priesthood defining this movement and it's trying to squelch other other forms, right? This is very much, I think, pushing for something more decentralized that we are able to uh, invite any of the people into a dialogue around and it's an additional lens, right? So yes, we're starting from a clean slate in our imaginations, but in interacting with people, interacting with the campus, this is intended to be much more of an engaging process as you, you think about it from a financial perspective, you think about an ethical perspective, think about it from a teleological for a future perspective and the hypothesis is that will actually help enrich people and bring them together. And yes, there's lots of problems around power and inequity that need to be addressed. And there are people working very hard at those things. If we're lucky, this will become another tool in the toolbox to help us have better discussions, better imagining of alternatives, which is how we can maybe solve some of the problems that are resistant to our current techniques. And I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So in our, that concludes this part in our full next